So let's get started first with Canon. So Brett, you've been reviewing the 800 millimeter F11 and you've also been reviewing the 600, right? Yeah, I have. And I've, I've actually used the 800 more than I have the 600 so far, but they are very similar lenses. Yeah. Um, so you want me, you want to walk us through it first? You want me to bring up the images? Like, yeah, sure. Stuff? I can walk you through it. So in case you guys haven't seen it, this, this lens is really rather unique. Um, this is actually a, a, a fixed F-stop prime. It's an 800 millimeter F11 prime. You can't go beneath F11. You can't go above F11. So you have to love F11. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you can see, this is in its collapsed form right now. And it's actually a really pretty long lens. It's about it's about 10, 11 inches long un, uh, with it being collapsed. And when you extend it, you add about another five inches in length Jeez. To, this, to this bad boy. So it's like a 15 inch length uh, lens. And it's actually the length of my, uh, of my forearm from my elbow to, the, to about the base of my fingers when it's fully extended. Um, but despite that, it's actually a really easy lens to manage because it's so light. This thing weighs just over two pounds. It's really super light. Um, and actually the way the front is designed, I don't know if you can see this here, the front of the lens is nicely textured. And there are these indents around the edge, which give you a really nice place to get a, a good firm grip on the lens as well. Um, the manual focusing ring is a bit further back, so you don't have to worry about holding it and hitting the manual focus ring. It just feels really good in the hand. And I was, I've been really pretty surprised by the by the uh, ergonomics of this lens so far. Now, when you put it up to your eye to shoot, like where are you usually putting your hand, like where the two sections meet or? I, I always hold it right here at the very end. So as I'm shooting, I'm, I'm like this with my fingers right at the very end of the lens. Because Did I can. Go ahead. So go ahead. So I don't, I don't grip it right here because it kind of wobbles a little bit and this, Part of my issue as well, in terms of build quality, this isn't an L lens, this is actually a pretty cheap lens, it's a $900 lens, but this barrel actually has a little bit of flex to it mm. when you grip it. So you really don't want to hold it right here. Holding it right at the very end, you can actually get a good stable platform, you can bring your elbows close in, you can hold it nice and tight at the end, and you've got the grip and you've got those indents, and you can get a good purchase on it. Now, is that the lens hood at the front too, or no? There, there is no lens hood. Ah. Oh. Yeah, so this is, it's just a textured grip, and that is it. I don't know if you can buy a lens hood. I imagine if you could, it would make that 15-inch lens when it's extended probably closer to 20 inches long or so. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Now, these yeah. lenses, they're pretty much like an evolution of the old reflex lenses, and... Uh, for anyone that's been shooting long enough, you know what those are. They were also called mirror lenses. For anyone that hasn't been shooting that long, these lenses basically are an evolution of those older lenses. And they were really well known for having this nice donut-shaped bokeh that was gorgeous. But they were also like really long focal lengths with a fixed aperture and for some odd reason they were really, really tiny. And the reason why is because uh, they usually had like a mirror built into them, but this doesn't, I believe. No, this doesn't. This is just a, a straight up regular old lens. No, uh, no mirror in there. Yeah. But I mean, it's still pretty cool. The fact that it's like telescoping. I mean, Canon used to have like those really cool push pull zooms, but this is a prime. Right. Exactly. And I was actually going to bring that up. The, uh, the push pull zoom I used to have, it was a 100 to 400 f4 five six i think it was an l series lens and yeah i used to really enjoy doing that but on this lens as soon as you extend it out and lock it back in place and the, the camera will not work until you lock the ring like the screen is just there's an error message on the screen you can't use anything on the camera till you lock it but once it's in place you're good to go it's ready to fire that is fantastic let's yeah, take a look at some images go ahead yeah. i'm sorry no absolutely let's, let's pull them up but um there are some good points and some bad points about this lens. Um, one of the issues I've been having with it is, yes, it does focus at f11, at 800 millimeters, obviously. When you do focus with it, it the, the focus area in the camera drops down to about the same size as the focus area in the 6D2. So you lose a large a portion of your autofocus points 
with this lens. And it's the same on the 600 millimeter as well. Um, being f11, I have noticed some focusing issues. Um, it hunts a lot. And I've been finding it very difficult to capture birds in flight because of that, because it just hunts all the time. Well, I wouldn't have gotten that from the images that you're shooting. Yeah. Yeah. But you also notice a lot of the stuff I'm shooting is almost static, like the bird shots. Okay. The let's take a look. Yeah. I haven't been able to catch, be, I haven't been able to capture a hummingbird in flight yet. Um, because when a subject is moving, it's, it, it hunts a lot. Okay. Let's take a look. Let's take a closer look. Can you see those? Yes. Okay. So that's a hummingbird. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And he was just sitting there nestled up on that tree, not moving a whole lot. And once it grabs focus, it holds it really well. Um, it's just that on moving subjects, it will, it will hunt. Okay. Let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit on, oh man, this is sharp. Yeah. It's a really sharp lens. And I believe this was probably ISO 3200. I believe I was shooting these at, but, um, yeah, this is a really sharp lens. And this is on the R6, right? This is the R6, yes, sir. Yeah, this is really sharp. That's dog. That's my dog, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, uh, those are English sparrows, right? I believe so, yeah. This one yeah, looks a little again, rough. He was, uh, yeah. <laughs> Looks like he had a bad morning that day. But you can see the man being an 800 millimeter lens, the background is just completely obliterated. Um, and this guy right here, this was again, um, ISO 3200. Once you get the subject that's nice and still and you know where you're pointing this lens at, you can get incredibly sharp shots. I see, uh, I can tell from your composition, you're right about basically being the area of the 60 Mark II, which was around the center, really, right? It's all around the center. Yep. You lose all of, all of the uh, periphery focus points. Man, you got a B in there, too. Yeah, there's actually a war going on out there between them right, right now. The, uh, the hummingbirds will come in and land and the, the you know, yellow jackets will chase them off and go to have a fight. <laughs> oh, man. I Hell hate yeah. yellow jackets. So these images were from a football game. And, you know, a lot of people have been worried about this lens being an F11 only lens. Um, you know, I've been hearing comments where F11 is worthless. It's going to be pointless. Uh, you're going to have to crank the ISO up. And honestly, it's, it's nothing you have to worry about. Now, a lot of the images you're going to see from this game are at ISO extremes. Um, I think the lowest ISO I shot at during this game was 6,400 and the highest was 24. 5,800, I believe. Um, but these new Canon bodies and even the EOS R, the high ISO performance is really pretty fantastic. Um, and this lens is going to be used primarily in the day by wildlife photographers. So you're not going to have any issues with the noise at all. With this yeah, but, but even so, I mean, like maybe if someone wants to crop or something like that, but yeah. I mean, these are great still. Oh yeah, they're fantastic. Um, and you'll notice this was this was before the game, so there was still a bit, little bit of sunlight out. Floodlights hadn't really kicked in yet, but um, you'll see them on the images later on, even at ISO twenty thousand, um, it, it's not an issue. So this, I was actually standing behind the end of the field, um, probably twenty yards behind the end of the field, and these guys were on the halfway line. And this isn't cropped. This is just filling up the frame completely at 800 millimeters. So How old are these idea. kids? They're high school students. Okay. Yep. Yeah, but no, you're right. That gives us an idea of like the framing yeah, you, and everything else. You can get incredible reach. And again, this is the same situation. I was behind the end of the field. These guys are halfway line. So it can't track very well, right? It really can't track very well at all. That's so sad. It, it is sad. Now, when you do have a stationary subject, like again, with the hummingbird, and the hummingbird come and, la come and landed on the feeder, um, and it acquires focus, and you have this set to animal tracking, it will pick up the animal eyes and things like that. But in terms of using this as a lens for birds in flight, um, you, you're going to have to be a really, really skilled photographer. Now, these are result. bobcats. Were you using animal AF or like human AF for this? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Maybe I should have switched it to animal. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe that would have worked. But again, this one, I was across the other side of the field and this is the, the away team. So they were clear across the, the field and again, no crop. This just completely fills up the frame. So that gives you an idea of the kind of reach you'll get with the 800 millimeters. And once again, face detection does work, right? Face detection, eye detection, it's all there. Absolutely, it's all there. It works really pretty well. But again, you're just limited right to the center portion of the sensor in terms of focusing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, have you tried focusing and recomposing at all? Yeah, and again, this, this lens, as soon as, you, if you have a, a, a subject in focus and you move, it will start to hunt like crazy. And whatever shot you were trying to get, you'll miss it because it'll just be hunting. Mm, gotcha. It's really, it's really frustrating when it nails focus and you get the shot and it's super sharp. It's beautiful, um, but I've been frustrated so many times with the hunting issue. It's, I, I've tried getting birds in flight, and again, it was, it was on an overcast day, and I couldn't get anything in focus. To keep, the lens was just hunting back and forth all the time. Man. It's a big issue. Yeah, it's a shame. I'm reviewing the, uh, I think it's the 100 to 500. I'm forgetting because I have so many things in my apartment right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's nailing focus, no problem. Oh, yeah. But that's like an F4 to 7.1. Yep, and that lens is, is what, 2,500, I think, 2,600 bucks. And this is like 900, right? 900, yeah, absolutely. It's, this lens definitely isn't going to be for um, professional use um it's definitely aimed more at like the hobbyist enthusiast birder or wildlife photographer um it, it just for like the reasons i've been using this was iso 20,000, by the way there's no issues at all with that um but um this is definitely going to be used by someone who likes to go and sit out in their yard and capture pictures of, of birds or wildlife running through their yard or if you you go to a wildlife refuge and like we have here in Oklahoma and there's bison in the field or things like that, but it's definitely not going to be suitable for, for tracking animals. Yeah. That's really unfortunate because I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, you know, Canon, a lot of their audience is sports based and it would have been mm -hmm. cool if they had something for like, you know, the photographer that wants to shoot like their high school football game or something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess they have a couple lenses, but nothing with reach like this. No, not not just yet. Uh, not unless you, uh, you 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 adapt the lens. But um, really, anyone who wants to use it for professional use the R six or R five for professional sports, that's where the one hundred four hundred is gonna gonna really come into its own. Yeah, that's right. But using this lens for shots like this, where you can when you can isolate a subject, it's it's really pretty cool. Actually, this is one of my favorite shots of the night. This was right after we scored a touchdown. Bridge Creek doesn't score many touchdowns, so this was a big deal. <laughs> mm. But um, I mean, I had fun with it. It's um, one thing you're going to have to really get used to with a lens like this is finding your subject through the EVF is going to be incredibly challenging. Um, one of the things I've been using uh, to help me photograph birds is actually, I don't know if you've seen it, it's like a red dot site from Olympus that you can put into the hot shoe on top of the camera and you focus on your subject using the red dot sight because the field of view through this lens is like three degrees. Yeah, 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 I know about that. Yep, so that actually helps out a lot. And if you're not used to using super telephoto lenses, this is gonna be a steep learning curve for you because like I say, you've got such a narrow field of view. Um, just even sitting on, on the porch and trying to capture pictures of birds at my feeders, it's, it can be really hard to find a subject. So have you tried putting it on like a tripod and trying to do like astrophotography with it at all or something like that? I have not. No. Mm. And actually I do have a Star Trek. I mean, astrophotography with something like this would be, I mean, you'd be able to probably get a, a one second exposure before you start getting trails in the sky. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I get you that. Have to use, yeah, you have to use the 500 rule, but I do have a, an astro tracer, an astro tracker that I could probably mount it to and, and try to do some deep space um but being f11 would be would be pretty hard mm, yeah no that makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know man like i'm sitting here thinking about this lens and i'm like mm. i think it's good 
for a wildlife photographer as I completely do or like someone that has like a big backyard or something like that but I'm really wondering like this lens isn't weather sealed either right it's not weather sealed and that's another big big downer for it because you know even amateur and, and enthusiast and hobbyist birders like to go out on a on a dewy morning you know and it's a bit humid outside or if it's snowing outside and you like to capture that that nice contrast between like snow and say cardinals um and this lens it just wouldn't be able to do that so that's a massive massive downer I can imagine if you tried to go out in snow, this would be a nightmare for a number of reasons. One, because of, you know, the telescoping elements. That's probably mm -hmm. something where uh, a lot of snow can get in. But also, yep. as snow much so is moving in front of, let's say, like a sparrow or something like that, and you want to photograph the bird, it's not going to be able to nail focus at all. Right. It'll start hunting again, for sure. Oh, yep. man. Yep. So that's one of the things I've been wrestling with. It's like, you know, who is this? Who is it for? And it's, it's unfortunate because I don't, I can't really see enthusiasts or hobbyists picking it up because there's no weather ceiling. And, um, you know, the focusing issues are really going to stop people buying it if they like to get birds in flight. Um, so it's just a kind of an, it's like an oddity. It's a great lens and you can get some fantastic shots with it, but it's in very specific situations that you'll be able to get fantastic shots with it. I really wonder if like, maybe they were doing this as like a proof of concept to their themselves and like, maybe they're gonna do a faster version at F8 or like F6.3 or something like that. That's obviously bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm wondering the same thing because I was really thinking about this lens. I'm like, yeah, this will be cool. And then the more I thought about it and the more I learned about it, I was like, I don't really know, man. Yeah, yeah, it's really weird. One thing I will say about it is you get four stops of IBIS with this as well. So hand holding it, being able to hand hold a lens at 800 millimeters with one hand, that's, that's unheard of. It kind of reminds me of four thirds, you know, micro four thirds. Mm -hmm. um, you, how much is that? How much does that uh, Canon L six hundred millimeter weigh? Twelve pound. A lot, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you you can hand hold this at eight hundred millimeters, and you can still get some really nice shots of it. That's what makes this lens really cool. Canon has definitely tried innovating, and so I have to give them props for for trying that. But its use case, number of use cases for this lens is very very small. Now, back up a bit. So, this lens doesn't have IS built in. It does have IS built in. Oh, yeah. so you're saying you get four stops plus the five stops or plus four the, stops total? I think it's four stops total. Okay. I need to double check that. But yeah. Um, but, see, but yeah, it will work in conjunction with the body. So, hand holding 800 millimeters, which is what all those shots were, is, is very easy to do. Yeah, no, and I mean, for anyone that's seen this before, when he, he was testing out the R6 before, he was able to handle to like six seconds with wider lenses before. Yeah, six seconds at 15 mil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really important thing for a lot of photographers to be able to do now, like hand mm -hmm. hold at a really long shutter speed. But like, what's the slowest you shot this with, 250th or something? Yes, yeah, around about 1 200th, 1 250th. And again, if your subject is nice and still, then you can get some pretty sharp shots with it. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> also keep that ISO down as well. Yeah, but I mean, hold it up to your arm because you're saying it's like from your forearm to like, or the elbow rather to... Yeah, I mean, from like if I line that up to my elbow, you can't even get, can't even get it all in there. Jeez. So you can see that it comes just down beneath the end of my fingers and that's lined up with my elbow. So this thing is, is massive. So when you pack it, you obviously can't put it together with the camera in a camera bag unless it's like a giant backpack, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's going to have to be separate. <sighs> I really but hate again, lenses you, like that. Once you collapse it, it does come down to about 10 inches, but that is still the whole length of my forearm from my elbow to my wrist. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Um, you don't get a tripod collar. You don't get a lens suit. It does have a a tripod um, attachment on the bottom there so you can mount this on a tripod if you need to I don't see any reason why you would need to do that because the lens is so light you can just hand hold this lens all day long 
So what I'm wondering now is what's the front filter thread? 95 millimeter. Ooh, geez. I yeah. was about to say. <laughs> yeah, it's a big old hunk of glass at the front there. Let me show you that. Wow. So, yeah, it's a massive front element. Yep. So any filters are going to be pretty costly as well. Yeah, it also looks from the images that like the color seems a little bit more muted than other Canon lenses I've seen. Yeah, and that for me is, is actually a plus because if I'm shooting wildlife, I don't want overly saturated colors. I want them to be about as natural as possible. Um, so that I actually, I actually prefer that on lenses like this. Okay, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I was asking about the front filter because I was like, hmm, maybe I can put like a polarizing filter on that thing. But right. 95 millimeters. 95, yeah. And again, of course, you remember if you put a, a polarizer on a polarizer on here, the lens is already f11. That's gonna it's gonna darken it and things pretty mm. significantly. Yeah, the f11 is is both a good and a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's one of those odd little lenses. You know, it's 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 a great lens. But like, again, the use case scenario list is very short. Yeah, it's just, I'm wondering, like, I mean, obviously we're both concerned for the whole photo industry right now. Like who's mm. gonna buy this lens? What's gonna be their strategy around the holiday season? Like what's gonna happen? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, our reviews and our thoughts are usually like spot on with other reviewers. We find some things that they don't, but like, they're probably all gonna sit there wondering the same thing. Like what's this lens for? Yeah, who's it for? Who's going to buy it? Um, and I can't honestly see a, an enthusiast or hobbyist buying a nine hundred dollar lens to sit on their front porch and just take pictures of birds in their front garden. That's just me. No, yeah, that's, that's true. A, that's a big chunk of change. It's still nine hundred dollars. It's cheap for what it is, but it's nine hundred bucks. Yeah, but then again, you're saying it that way, and I'm thinking like we're probably all going to go back into quarantine very soon. Like mm -hmm. someone's probably bound to set up like uh a plant uh, no sorry a bird bath or mm -hmm. like something else to attract birds and all that kind of stuff so maybe that might be like their sort of escape yeah definitely could could see that for sure and also the other thing as well is you remember these work with the new teleconverters so this 800 millimeter lens if you use the two times teleconverter would be 1600 mil <laughs> 1600 oh, millimeters at f2020 f22 equivalent so yeah i'm thinking yeah. about uh years ago canon had like a 1200 five six or something like that and the mm -hmm. thing was massive and uh remember when i was working at b and h like at one point i think we had one or two and like other than that like sports illustrated had one the cia had one the fbi had one i think some like middle eastern prince had one. Oh wow yeah but like this is so much smaller and obviously there's so many less stops of uh light being in there but wow just think about that like yeah it's it's really pretty incredible to see an 800 millimeter lens this small honestly it's again it reminds me of four thirds micro four thirds and maybe that's what they were trying to go for to say hey look you can step up to a full frame camera and you can still get your light lenses to micro four thirds users who knows so does that mean you're going to leave four thirds and you're going to go to a full frame again, Brett? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is the weight like comparable to your Olympus stuff or? The weight is comparable, but again, you know, with the Olympus lenses, you're still getting those faster apertures. Mm, yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a major advantage there because at like F 1.8, like you're getting double the depth of field. So it's really useful for that kind of stuff. Right. Absolutely, yeah. but you're still getting all the light gathering cap capabilities of f1.8. So, mm -hmm. yep, yeah, it's just an interesting one. I need to do some more testing with it, but um, mm, my 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 thoughts are mixed on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems better than your Nikon uh review. You were like, Yeah, it's nice, it's, it's nice, <laughs> <laughs> it's the beige sedan. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I remember when you told me that on the phone, I was laughing so hard. <laughs> All right, Brett. Thanks for uh, thanks for your insights on this lens, man. Sure thing.